Welcome to the STNG USA Corporation webinar, Material Selection for Prosthetic Socket Fabrication. Today we're going to talk about different types of prostheses that we normally would encounter. And one of those that, things that we want to look at are the different types of prosthesis that we want to make. So if we look at this wide variety of different types of sockets, there's different levels, but there's also different functions. We have some with joints and thigh lacers. We have some that are weight bearing joints. We also have flexible sockets. We have elevated vacuum. We also have adjustable brims with a quick medical device. So we need to think about what we're trying to accomplish and also we need to approach these differently as far as where we're applying material, what types of resins we're using, what types of steps we need to do the fabrication. So there's a lot involved. When we talk about composite materials, normally we're thinking carbon fiber or even fiberglass. But if you think of a composite laminate, there's a wide variety of different composites out there. Basically, there's layers of fibrous composite materials that are joined together with the matrix, which is the resin, and you have your reinforcement fibers. So some of the properties we look at are in-plane stiffness, bending stiffness, and strength. Now you see how it's broken down differently. Stiffness is not really strength. Stiffness is different property than strength would be. So if we think of carbon fiber, Carbon fiber, when you laminate it, it automatically becomes stiff. So the interesting point is these days, there's discussions around soft sockets, flexible sockets, or really rigid sockets. And there's a lot of variations in thoughts. Some people like more flexible, some people really like the stiff socket. And then you have everything in between. So some of these things we need to think about when we're applying a design. So a composite laminate can also be something else that we see every day that we don't really think about, and that is plywood. Plywood has a matrix, which is bonding all these fibrous materials together. If you look at the wood, you can see the different layers and the direction is different that all these layers of wood are laying on. And depending on how thick this plywood is, you'll get different properties out of it. So if you were to nail this to the side of a house, you'll get a lot of stiffness and strength added to the house. But if we take the same sheet of plywood and we support it on either end of the long length of the plywood and we apply some weight to it, you'll see it starting to deflect. So depending on what the needs are, and how we apply these materials will get different properties out of them. So let's talk about a matrix. A matrix is a resin that holds the fibers together in our sockets. Now another form of a matrix is concrete, which is a powder. You add that to water, you mix it together, you add all your other sand and gravel, what have you, and then you get your material. But what we're doing we're making sockets and the method that we use is a vacuum infused technique. And the ratio that we're really looking for is a 40% resin, 60% fiber ratio. If we vary from that, then we jeopardize either a very flexible socket that may not have much strength or a socket that is very stiff, heavy in resin, and the resin will be prone to failure because now you have excess resin. There's nothing to reinforce it with. So we really wanna think about the types of resin that we're using because the resin itself has its own strength properties to it. If we look at polyester, vinyl ester, acrylic or epoxy, we're going from the lower strength to the higher strength. Also, there are other properties to these resins that we need to think about. Some of it is health-wise. When we look at a polyester resin, its strength is not as high as an epoxy. Also, 
polyester resin has an issue of sticking to epoxy, which is usually used to coat carbon fiber after the manufacturing process. So the issue is not only is it a little strength, it has a compromised bonding effect to carbon fiber. It also has a, a toxic outgassing. So the outgassing can definitely affect your health. And one of the things you wanna look at is the MSDS sheet. The MSDS sheet, if it states styrene or byproduct of styrene, then it is a polyester-based resin. And you can see on the bottom here, there's a note, generally not recommended for using with structural applications with carbon or aramid fibers. And this was based off of a study uh, that I found on the internet. Here's a label. It's a warning label and you can see within the circle, it states tiring. And it's not a very good byproduct to breathe. When we look at acrylic resin, acrylic resin is very familiar to our industry. A lot of people use it. And for the most part, it's not as toxic. The one thing is it is very stinky, uh, partly because some of the manufacturers actually add an additive to perfume it so that you can smell it, so that you know that it's present. Now, acrylic in the can, if you let it sit for a very long time, it will start to separate. So it is very sensitive to this ratio within the can. So before you open it, it's a good idea to go ahead and vigorously shake it to remix those parts. If you get an 80-20 resin, which is very common, you're going to have 20% flexible resin in there. And where it separates to the top or the bottom, uh, that I am not sure, but if you let it sit, you're going to get more of one resin than the other. And as you get towards the bottom of the can, if it's that 20% flexible that's sitting on the bottom and you haven't shaken the can, you're going to get more flexible resin out of it as you get to the bottom. So one of these things to think about. Also, acrylic, or actually any resin that we use, is sensitive to the ratio that we're mixing the hardener. If you go over 2% with acrylic or under, you're going to jeopardize uh, the, the finished product of your lamination. If you have too much hardener, what will happen is it'll lead to a very hot hardening process, or it can induce a lot of bubbles during that hardening process as well. We've all had the issue of getting bubbles in our laminations. And usually it's when we're rushing to get this lamination done. So measure everything out, get a scale, use the scale. Now, carbon, carbon acryl is a different mixture than the 8020. It's a little more viscous, so it wets out carbon fiber materials a little easier. The normal 8020 is a little thicker, so you end up trapping air bubbles, and that's one of the things you need to look at as well. And we'll talk about why carbon fiber is more susceptible to trapping air bubbles a little later. Now the pigment as well, you need to be sure that it's 2% and you don't want to fluctuate and add more. If you add more, it can actually soften your lamination. The other thing too, is when you string it, you can get darker spots and lighter spots and streaking it within their lamination. When we look at epoxy, epoxy for the most part is not as deadly as polyester resin. The hardener, for the most part, is usually corrosive. Um, it's still a good idea to have ventilation no matter what resin you're using, whether it's um, acrylic or it's stinky or epoxy. Epoxy can also get a little stinky, but it could still be a little irritant to your uh, nasal passages. So always take a precaution. The types of resin you use uh, really depends on what you're familiar with and what you like. Um, these are just some 
random shots of resin. Um, I've used the ResTech and the ER resin, which is readily available to us. And of course, as you get into the higher quality side of resins, uh, from polyester going up to epoxy, where you have the higher quality resin, uh, your cost is going to be more because of the resin quality. But always check your MSDS sheet. If it says polyester, then you may not be getting an epoxy. <clears throat> now, some of the forces that are occurring on a socket we'll get into. And what we're going to use as a reference is this part of the phase gate. It's a single limb support. It's basically during mid stance where they're trying to balance on the prosthesis and progress their foot forward. And we're not looking at heel strike or toe off or we're just looking at this one part of the gate because there's a lot going on here. So we can see where we have different forces just within this one part of the gate cycle. You can see there's a loading on top of the prosthesis from the body weight. We have the hydrostatic loading within the socket. We also have the corrective balancing. So we're gonna get a torque motion. And we also have the upward pushing motion of the ground pushing into the prosthesis because as the patient is loading the prosthesis, you're gonna get a counteracting force pushing back. I've seen many different types of sockets. Uh, I've been fortunate to travel around the world and visit many labs. And one of the things I like to do is just out of curiosity, look around and see what and how everybody is doing things. So here we have a socket and this socket was about a quarter of an inch thick, about six millimeters. And it was primarily nylon stocking net. Nylon stocking net, uh, for the most part, when you think of economics around the world. It's uh, readily available. It's relatively inexpensive. Uh, the one problem is when you get into a really thick socket like this, you tend to get a very heavy socket and it's also very bulky. Most of these sockets like this one use a foam inner liner. So now you have the foam liner then you have the thickness of the socket on the outside. And that's a lot of material to wear on your leg. The other thing is if you look on the picture on the left, you can see by my thumb on the shelf, you can see where it's discolored. And when I looked closer into it, I saw that it was actually a resin starvation. There were some air bubbles there. And also if you look towards the bottom of the socket on the inside, you can actually see that there is some lighter color on the bottom as well. And that is from the socket adapter that they laminated in. And it's very close to the surface on the inside. And I've seen where some of these sockets have actually failed where the component pushed inside because there's not enough reinforcement between that socket adapter and the inside of the socket. So those are some of the things we need to think about. So here are some of the typical forces, but this is looking at torque. If we look at the stance phase versus the swing phase side, you can see how that curve really moves. And this is how much rotation torque is occurring on the prosthesis. So as they walk, they're loading, there's getting some torque because when you make contact with your foot, you get that torque lateral motion. And then as we're going into pre-swing, we're rolling over the foot, it's shifting and now we're starting to rotate the other direction as we're going onto the toe. So these are some of the other things to think about. It's a very dynamic motion that's occurring. So when we look at loading, AK or BK, we can see that during vertical load, we have this hydrostatic load from the total contact. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to burst the socket because of all that inner load. And the socket is trying to counteract that and reduce some of that motion and the load. So it has to dissipate that. On the BK, if it's a solid lamination, you have the whole surface of that BK to load. On the AK, 
if we have any windows, well now most of that load is going and being transferred to the frame because your flexible inner part is gonna flex and allow some of that hydrostatic pressure to move. The other thing is depending on where you have any bony areas, well now you're relieving that and you're distributing some of that load around it. So we don't wanna arbitrarily cut away some of the high pressure relieving areas that's taking some of the load and leave in where the bony area is. Now you're, you're loading a part that's not really dispersing any pressure. So again, now we have this torque load where we're trying to balance on limb and you can see the counteractive force. So you have force from the foot, force from the bottom of the socket, force from the top of the socket, or the limb is trying to add some torque to provide some balance to the body weight. And as you look on the AK side, you can see where that bottom arrow is, and that applies to the BK side. It's a very high stress area. And what it wants to do on the AK side is it actually wants to try to tear that socket at that lower radius where that window is. It's a very high stress area. And then the counter pressure, we, we refer to this as a push through. If you have a socket like, for example, the person on the right, he's standing there and what he has is he has a socket that is wrapped out of C form. And this was during a demonstration that we did with a maglock. We wrapped it, put the adapter for the socket on there, and then reinforced it with um, fiberglass wrap. And he wanted to try it out. So I told him, okay, you can walk around for maybe 20, 30 minutes, but don't do more than that. And don't go up and down stairs because it's temporary and it could possibly fail. It's no different than if we do a lamination with the socket, but don't provide any reinforcement material to, pr to prevent this push through. But we also wanna tie in the component to prevent any pull out as well. So if you think about designs, and if we look at aerospace, most of the airplanes started with aluminum wings at least the ones that we've seen. Uh, before that, there's wood. Uh, you even have some homemade kit planes that have wood and uh, like a cloth for the wing. Um, on the commercial airplane, it's an aluminum skin and it has an aluminum frame on the inside. It's very light and it's made to flex. So we can see how when it's static, it's straight, when it's in the air, it starts to bend and deflect. And it's designed to do this. When we look at the picture on the left of a Boeing 787, it has a composite wing. And when they use composites, most of the parts they're looking at designing it into are very large or very long, like this wing. And you can see how much deflection there is. It's made to deflect 10, 10 feet in flight, which is quite a bit. If you're not used to this and you look out the window and you see the wing, it, it really looks like it's about ready to snap, but that's what it's designed to do. Um, you can see at 26 feet, maximum deflection of 150%, that is a lot. Uh, I think that's more than the 747 wing was designed to deflect before it failed. And if you look at comparison of what we're dealing with, Prosthetic foot is very short, it has a very tight radius, and it's, even though we want some dynamic response motion out of it, it's a very different animal than a, than a wing. So some of these feet, I've seen where they failed exactly right where that arrow was pointing. And it wasn't necessarily in part from the foot just failing, but how the patient is using it. And a lot of times it's where, especially when I was at Shriners, these patients would come back, we'd see a, a fractured keel, and we'd ask them, what were you doing? What happened? And the response sometimes was, well, I was 
trying to take, get my prosthesis off and it wouldn't come off. So I put my foot, my good foot on the prosthetic foot and I pulled out of it. And well, now you're getting a very high load in the opposite direction that the foot was designed to load. It wasn't designed to load with them trying to pull the prosthesis off, which can be a very high load. And so it goes against the grain of the design of uh, the layout and then it, it failed. It started to delaminate. So when we talk about sockets, and we're trying to address some of the loads that are occurring, especially this body load, the vertical load, and the hydrostatic loading. We can add hoop strength by putting a circumferential layer of reinforcement material. And normally we do this out of habit anyway, which is a good thing because now you know what it's doing. It's, it's trying to stabilize the shape. It's reinforcing the brim and the popliteal and also the curves where the, the knee is on the posterior part on the popliteal shelf. In this demonstration, in this photo, you can see how the carbon fiber is actually into the opening. If we're four more careful, we can also go ahead and trim to where the carbon fiber is within the trim line. Then that way, when we're cutting out the socket, you don't have to worry about grinding into this. So there's some things to think about where we're applying it, how we're applying it, and thinking ahead of when we're finishing. But this will help with the hoop strength. And also, you'll see in the picture where we have the struts. So when you get this intersection of this hoop and the struts, you get the zero 90 degree effect of the fibers laying on top of each other, and you get a lot of racking prevention where it'll prevent it from moving back and forth and also deflecting because you have a very strong 090 reinforcement layer. When we look at the torque load from single limb balancing, one of the things that helps are the struts, the medial, lateral, anterior, posterior layup that we would normally would do. And that's to help address this. Now, when we think of an I-beam, if you're familiar with how they build buildings, it would look like the steel I-beam on the top left. Now, we don't use steel in the prosthesis because one, it's very bulky and very heavy. When we think about a composite I-beam, you can see where this picture on the lower left, this shape is not quite like an I-beam, but the effect is the same. So the I-beam effect is actually the separation of material. Um, Glenn Choi, the president of STMG, gave a talk, and he mentioned how when you separate material, the, the magnitude of stiffness goes up three times. And this is just by adding an extra layer. So for example, if you have carbon fiber, you separate with one layer, Nye glass, and then you add another layer of carbon fiber, but then you do another layup for a different socket, and you put your carbon fiber, and you put two layers of Nye glass, and then one layer of carbon fiber, you separate it by an extra layer, your magnitude of stiffness will go three times. So I wanted to see how this would relate to NSP. NSP is a unique material that. STNG has. And so what I did to do our I-beam, I got some uh, nigh glass. I cut our NSP unidirectional tape in half and I inserted it like this top left picture. I ran it the whole length of this segment of nigh glass that I wanted to use and I then folded it in half. So if you look at this upper right, you can see how it's folded. Uh, NSP is inside the nigh glass. Now I have two layers of nigh glass separating this NSP tape. I then put it on this AK mold that I had and it conformed really well. And what I did was I simply sold it, uh, sewed it right in the mid length of it so that when I draped it over the mold, it wouldn't migrate out of the nigh glass and I could simply just pull it to get the tension and it worked fine. 
I did the layup and it was very stiff. And this socket was made out of just nylon stockinette with acrylic, so it was very flexible, just to see how this NSP would do with this separation with the I-beam. So some of the forces that we see in a socket, they're very high. You can see how this component on this foot, which mounts the foot to the pylon, how it broke. It's a big chunk of stainless steel. And stainless steel is pretty tough, but you can see how it even made this fail. And if it's strong enough to make this fail, and I saw this at a shop and it got me to thinking, wow, that's a lot of force occurring. And I had asked out of curiosity, well, what type of patient was this? Was this a really big male doing construction? And the answer was, no, it wasn't. This was a, this was a petite lady, but her activity was horse riding. So getting up and off the horse, there's a lot of impact occurring. And if it's strong enough to make this fail, just think about the socket. So if you do the socket correctly, that won't be the weakest link. So if we look at this push through, we keep talking about push through of the, the loading and the pushing of the prosthesis up from the earth. One of the ways to counteract this is to definitely add some material. So what we can do to address this is simply add a double layer under the component. And you can see how it's staggered here. And it only needs to be staggered enough to have any material under the ears. And we wanna kind of stagger it enough where we can distribute the load better and if you really unwind the braid, what will happen is you'll get long fingers from the braid. And these fingers will actually blend in really well and you won't even see the transition. If you look here, you can see how it's really hairy. What I did was I took some of the braid material and I ran it through the holes. I just let it lay loose so that it helps to tie in the component. And then simply when you're ready to do your layers over the socket adapter, again, you can stagger the material and then tie it in and then have it running up. So on this particular socket, what I intended to do was to show that and how the layers are staggered. And if you've ever been to one of the conventions where we had a booth, we have the socket. I did not fray the ends so you can deliberately see where the edges are and where it's staggered. So this socket actually has four layers on the bottom, then it staggers to three, then there's two, and then it has one layer all the way to the top. So around the ears, it's flexible. Around the popliteal, just above it, it starts to get pretty rigid. And then it gets really rigid as we get towards the bottom. And that's to prevent the push through and the pull out. And you'll notice there's two layers of nigh glass that we're putting on there just to increase some of the I beam effect of the braid. And this socket in particular didn't have any tape in it. So if you add tape, it'll definitely be even stiffer. And this is some of the things that we're trying to avoid. If we look at the socket, we can see how the component pulled out. Initially, it was a call to a, the company saying, hey, you had a part that failed, and they sent us some pictures. So David Littig, who was the technical director prior to me, was going over this with me and letting me know kind of the things that developed from this. And I thought, wow, that's not good if it pulled out. But also, you'll notice how the ears snapped off. So what had occurred, as soon as I saw this picture, he didn't have to tell me what happened. I already could tell. Because 
If you look down here, we have urethane foam. There's no lamination. So if you try to bond this component on the foam, this is your weakest link right here, the foam. The foam is gonna to start to crush, it'll start to microfill, and then you get micro motion of the part because now this is gonna move, even though it's a micro movement, over time it's repetitive. It's like getting a piece of aluminum and bending it back and forth and back and forth many, many times. Pretty soon it'll crease, it'll start to fail, and then you can break it in half. So you can see how there's a clean snap here, and that's from micro movement and fatigue failure. And that's from putting this component on foam, which has no structural value, especially at the bottom of the socket. It should have been laminated. So you can see here, we can see the foam. We can see the component that was bonded directly on it, probably with light putty. There wasn't even a layer of sealing resin on it. Uh, but either way, it should have been the socket, should have had a lamination layer, and then you bond this socket adapter on and then tie up the layers. And if we look, if you look over here, you can see how most of it was from the outer layer of either night glass or something besides carbon fiber because the carbon fiber braid looks like one layer of braid, uh, carbon fiber and does not look like to have any tape on there either. So if there's this much force to rip it off, let it fatigue, they probably should have used at least two layers of the braid on top of a laminated socket before putting this component on. So we have different types of materials available to us. Thankfully, thankfully from the aerospace industry, um, but you, you can see that there are more materials being available. NSP is a, a nice new material to think about as a carbon fiber alternative. Now, one of the things we wanna think about and we're gonna discuss is the actual manufacturing process of carbon fiber. So if we look on the left, this is a figure, kind of the flow of how the manufacturing process goes. And on the, the descriptive part here with the verbiage, it's gonna talk about the different stages and what's occurring. When they make carbon fiber, they start with a base material, which they call can. And it's a blend of um, a petroleum-based product, which goes into a bath process where they add ingredients and they actually spin this base material into a fiber, which gets washed and stretched. And it becomes what's called a precursor. So the base material starts off looking kind of like NSP actually. It's a whitish material that they then go and they put on spools so then they can take to the next process. The next process would be where it gets oxidized and it turns into what's called pre-ox. So there's a lot of different terms for their, the material that they get after each process. The pre-ox is then carbonized and the carbonizing process starts to refine the product into more of a pure carbon. So some of the things that influences the grade of the carbon is not only how long you incinerate it, but also the quality of the pan. Because what you start off with that material, if it's a high grade material, as it goes through and gets oxidized, you get a more pure, higher grade carbon. Now, as it starts to go through the process, you get a very nice quality 
um, carbon fiber. It then goes through another process where it gets graphitized. It's kind of like a heat treating process. So it increases the strength of the material. After this, the, the carbon fiber will not bond to resin. So if we were to take this carbon fiber at this phase and try to laminate it, uh, most likely the socket would fail because we're not able to actually make uh, a good solid socket with the carbon because it won't stick to the resin. So then it needs to go through this additional phase where it gets oxidized and etched. And this etching helps the coating stick to it, which is usually an epoxy. So out of this, it goes to a winding station. So each of these fibers get bundled together into a yarn. And as it gets bundled together on this yarn and spooled, that yarn is what we refer to as a toe. Now, depending on how many yarns are, or fibers are in that toe, will make up the K rating, and it can range from 3K to 48K. So it all boils down to the quality of the carbon will allow you to have a lower K rating. Usually, in the case of a lower K rating, the grade of the carbon is higher. Because as you get to a 3K carbon, it's very expensive and it's harder to find in the sizes that we want as a braid. Um, and it's mostly used for automotive because it's, it's a very nice quality and it's also very strong. The interesting thing is the base pan material, you could start with say like a ton of material and it goes through the process and you get that much 3K material. It also, will produce the same volume, uh, well, not so much the volume, but the amount of carbon fiber you would get, say, in a 12K, the end product, the amount, would, would be the same as you would get with a 3K. So you might not necessarily get the same volume, but you actually start with the same amount of material. So the process of making the carbon fiber, even though you say start with the same amount of material, as it goes through the process and gets incinerated, you get that refinement occurring and so you end up with less bulk and you get a finer, smaller fiber. And that's how you can get a better quality with a lower K rating, but you get the same amount of strength basically. And so usually the amount of fibers that we get in the materials that we use in our field is about a 12K, and that's an average. Lately, I've noticed that there's been more 6K available, and that's some of the carbon that we actually sell. We have a 6K carbon and a 12K carbon. So some, one of the things to think about also that can influence how our sockets come out is our technique. If we pour in the resin, turn on the vacuum, we already have the bag tied off, but instead of letting the resin flow in by itself under the vacuum and gravity without squeezing it in, if we squeeze it in right away, what's gonna happen is we'll trap air bubbles under the component. And so the best way to avoid that is to go ahead and let the vacuum and gravity slowly feed the resin in. So instead of untying it and just letting it rush down, just let it slowly weep in. It'll start to work itself in the little areas and try to get all the air out. So you wanna to try to help your lamination as much as possible. Even if you're in a hurry, it's better to take a little bit of time now than to get a socket that has a lot of air bubbles, you can't get it out, and you're gonna end up having to redo it. Here's a good example. Some of the resins aren't as compatible with carbon fiber, yet epoxy 
is one of the better ones, but this actually is a carbon fiber socket with epoxy resin. And you can see how there's some air bubbles. And this is actually just something I noticed that was visually there right away. You could see it easily with your eye. And this is the reason why most of the time you want to use the vivac on the inner aspect of your socket when you're doing the elevated vacuum because these little bubbles can lead to a leak. So just to be careful, many people will go and they'll pull that vivac through the lamination because they don't want to risk having to finish the prosthesis just to find out that it's leaking. So NSP. NSP is a very unique fiber. It has 10 times the impact strength of carbon. It is half as stiff as carbon. Uh, and one of the things you can do is design in that dynamic stiffness. We talked about I-beam effect and fiber separation. So if you want a socket that's stiff, you can separate the fibers with an extra layer of nye glass. And we've done some testing where we've done two layers, four layers, and there was a dramatic difference in the stiffness. Uh, it also showed up in the impact test. And the impact test we'll talk about a little bit later too. Um, NSP, as it's manufactured, is not coated like carbon fiber. So it actually will saturate with the resin very easily. The nice thing too is because there is no coating on it, we don't have to deal with all these fibers that are coated that won't saturate and trap air. So that's one of the reasons why carbon fiber tends to have more air problems. You're actually trapping air with all of the fibers that are coated. The nice thing too is because it's a neutral color, you can put in your resin with your pigment and you don't have to tint that pigment up or down because like with carbon, it's black. You have to tint it really lightly just to get even close to what you're trying to tint it. If you're trying to do a white socket with carbon, uh, you're probably gonna have to do another lamination, which is one of the nice things too with NSP. You can do a one-shot lamination with a transfer and you don't have to worry about any of the colors not transferring through well. If you look at the shark, you can see how the colors really pop out, even with this lamination, and there's no pigment. So if we look at the weight comparison, at one cubic centimeter, uh, NSP is 1.3 grams per cubic centimeter. Carbon fiber weighs 1.75 grams per cubic centimeter, and fiberglass is over twice as heavy as NSP, it's 2.62 grams per cubic centimeter. So these are the, some of the things that we're trying to enlighten you with about NSP. Because one of the things, it's not a petroleum-based product. It is pretty light, saturates well, also has good strength qualities. If we look at these graphs, we have a test where we did some crush testing of these sockets. And the instrument ratings from the crush test are what we base some of the numbers off of that we got. Carbon fiber is the red graph here. And if we look at the graph going up and then with that line straight down, all that area within those red lines represents how much energy it took to make the fiber fail. So carbon fiber took this much energy. If we look at the hybrid, which is our parallax, you can see the graph. It's pretty much the same as carbon fiber in the shape, but you can also see that this graph now is more to the right. So as we get more farther to the right and farther to the right, it's a higher energy requirement to make the fiber fail. But the nice thing with the parallax, you can see the, sh the graph is about the same and it takes more energy to make that fiber fail. Also, now if we look at NSP, you can see how the graph is nice and long and it carries out very far to the right. So it's taking more energy to make it fail. If you will look at the pictures on the right, 
can see how the carbon fiber on the inside of that socket, it actually has cracked the fibers. The socket has failed. If you look at the NSP, there's some creasing. The resin might have fractured some, but the fibers were intact. So that's one of the nice things is carbon fiber sockets, when they fail, they're no good anymore. If you have a slight failure of the NSP socket like this where it's creased, chances are the socket is still intact. So it's not as urgent to replace the socket. The carbon fiber socket, if a patient comes in, first thing you're probably going to tell them is get your backup prosthesis. You need a new socket. The other thing with NSP is the health benefit of it because the safety of it, it's a body friendly material. The base product to make NSP or the main ingredient to make NSP is body friendly. It's used to make contact lenses, eye drops, cartilage and ligament replacements, just to name a few. So you can see that it's, it's not gonna kill you. It's not trying to kill you like carbon fiber. The nice thing too is we talked about three, um, the eye beam effect, fiber separation. We have this new NSP tape that has a unidirectional tape with a non-directional weaved component bonded directly to the unidirectional tape. So now you have your eye beam built in to the tape. So you don't have to separate it with an eyeglass, you can just go ahead and apply it straight to your socket, which is really nice. Uh, we did some testing with this, and the outcome was it's just as stiff as doing the separation with an eyeglass. But it's so much quicker and easier, you don't have to go and prepare it. You take the time to do it, just roll it out, cut what you need, apply it on, and away you go. If we look at this socket here, you can see there are no air bubbles. I tried looking for air bubbles on this socket. While I found the air bubbles on the carbon fiber socket, I couldn't find any air bubbles on this one. Again, because there's no coating, the air bubbles wick out really, really easily. And this is the nice thing because when you're doing elevated vacuum sockets, one of the nice things is you don't have to pull Vivac on the inside. I had some feedback from many people who have done it this way. They don't have to do an extra step. They just do the lamination, bond it to the plate, do the finished lamination, and they're done. So the NSP is true to the pigment that you add. The color you put in is the color you'll get out. You don't have to tint it up or down. Also with transfers, transfers come out really nice. The colors will pop and you don't have to do an additional lamination just to get a lighter background. You can just do what you normally do, add the transfer and it'll save you a step. And this socket in particular is, has a transfer on the inside. Um, and it's really neat because if you've seen the socket, it's kind of, it kind of has a 3D effect because it's on the inside. And when you turn the socket, it just really pops out at you. Now, one of the things um, is the finishing of NSP. NSP, before we started to manufacture, to use it for prosthetics, was used in ballistic panels. And it was part of a carbon fiber ballistic panel. And without it, the bullet would go right through and pierce the carbon fiber. With this added NSP, it helped to deflect the bullet so that the panel could stop it. And as such, just like with Kevlar, it can be an issue to edge if you don't slightly change your technique. And by slightly changing the technique, I mean trying to sand it just like carbon fiber. Most of the time when we sand carbon fiber, the issue is we can't get that fiber to move and come off. 
So what we want to do is use a sharp cone, high speed, and a light touch. We don't want to try to push it in and push really hard to try to break off that material. Because what's happening is if you use a rubber arbor and you push harder, what you're ending up doing is generating more heat. As you generate more heat, it starts to burnish off more resin, which adds to the fuzz. So if you just back up on the pressure, let the sanding cone do its work, you won't build up as much heat and it'll snap off the fibers. One of the most important things though is to make sure that your resin is fully cured. If you don't give it enough time to cure, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a soft lamination. And no matter what you do, it's gonna come out a little fuzzy because now you're really gonna burnish off the resin easier. Now, Cascade has these metal sanding cones that have a, a diamond coating on it. The nice thing about this is they have a rough and a fine cone and it sands off composite materials much easier than a, a regular sanding cone. Because it's also a heat sink, you don't have to wor worry about generating heat. The other nice thing is your upfront cost might be high, but as you start to use this cone, it doesn't wear out. It may gunk up with some material, but simply throw it in the oven and you pull it out and you peel off that whatever's coating on the sanding cone and it's good as new basically. So you wanna do this from a rough to a finer sanding cone and then do a wet sand so that you get a nice clean edge. The other thing is, you can't stress it enough, is to use light pressure. So if we look, I am videotaping on one, with one hand, and I'm sanding with the other. And then I'm using a flapper wheel. This flapper wheel works really well after you've gone from a rough to a fine cone, and it'll help to finish off the edge and get it much closer to where you want to wet sand. So this is a good picture of that flapper wheel. It's a Tycro sanding wheel. There's some sandpaper with a uh, Tycro material in between. And I started with this fuzzy socket on the left, on the end. I uh, finished it with this flapper wheel, and you can see it cut down a lot of the fuzz. This prosthesis was made by David Liddig, and at the time it was uh, over four years old. And one of the things that he remarked about was that even though it got beat up really badly, you can tell by the components under the socket how beat up it was. It didn't have any stress fractures on the socket itself. If we look at the brim, you can see how it got worn down from kneeling. Now, if you had a carbon fiber socket, this thing would be all fractured up. The edge, the middle of the socket where the impacts were, there would, have, there would be a lot of spider fractures all over it. And it probably would have failed by now. <clears throat> now, we talked about uh, 6K carbon. We have the Ultra 6 Carbon, and it's a 6K. So if you want a 6K, the nice thing is because there are less threads to worry about, it lays down and conforms much easier to the model that you're laminating. One of the things that you will need to do though is massage the material uh, when you're doing the lamination. Even, even with the NSP or even a 12K, my, my habit is to really massage the lamination as the resin is working down. Even after the whole socket is saturated, I still massage the material everywhere. And that's just to help make the fibers move and spread and have good coverage so it's not all bolted up in one area. And it'll also help to make the, the lamination look more even. <clears throat>
So that's one of the things to check. Make sure your lamination, the fibers have dispersed and covered everywhere, and it's looking more even as far as the braid. And that'll tell you that you've uh, massaged the, the material enough. If, if you don't, um, especially with the 6K, because when depending on the size that you use, if you use a smaller size, for example, like a four inch carbon braid, uh, the Ultra 6 on a BK, uh, it may be one inch too small in width. And so you might have some extra spacing on there and you might have to really massage it to conform it. The one thing with the NSP, if you use the same size NSP, it actually will move by itself. And especially when you massage it, you can use a four inch braid where you would normally would use a five inch carbon braid. So massage it very well. And one of the nice things is you can see how thin the lamination comes out. Now, the picture on the bottom left, you can see how nice and filled in that braid looks. And it's kind of a, a, a glossy finish and that's with an epoxy. If you use an acrylic, you're gonna see more braid definition on the surface because epoxy is a little thicker and it likes to fill in a little nicer. Uh, the acrylic is more watery and when it hardens it tends to thin down more and you'll get more of a rough surface of that texture of the carbon fiber. When we talk about tape, we have NSP tape, we have carbon tape, we have the Ultra 6 tape. So it's, uh, again, a high quality unidirectional tape. We also have parallax, which is very nice. We talked about the curve that it generated. It performed similar to carbon fiber, but it took more energy. And the reason is because now you have two materials interwoven to each other. And what it's doing is it's providing its own I-beam effect. So now you've separated the carbon with the NSP, and you've also separated the NSP with the carbon fiber, which is really nice because you have a good compromise. You have a really good stiffness of a carbon fiber, and now you've added more stiffness with the NSP, but you also have 10 times the impact strength with the NSP and they're rolling into the carbon. So I've seen some people use NSP for the inner socket, use parallax for the outer socket for the finish lamination, and you can change it up either way. So it's nice to know that you have a variety of different materials available depending on what you want to do. So you can see how when you pigment it, it has a nice contrast between the carbon and the pigmented NSP. And here we see with the green. So carbon, we have a 12K carbon as well. So if you like 12K carbon, come check out our carbon with the 12K. We have different widths, different sizes, and it should help fulfill a lot of your material needs, whether it be the NSP, the Parallax, or 12K, and the uh, Ultra 6 carbon. Well, thank you for attending the webinar. And please check us out. If you have any further needs, you can go to our website, stngco.com. Thank you very much.